All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for this privilege, Lord, to come before your holiness, Lord. We thank you for the gift of your Son, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we thank you, as we're going to share today, that you left heaven and came down to this earth and placed yourself in the Virgin Mary, Lord, and then lived 33 and a half years without sin, that you might go to the cross and take our sins upon you, that we might obtain your righteousness, Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for the interventions, Lord, of the media, Lord, and uh, those that are participating with us today here and those who will be with us online, through Facebook, through YouTube, through our website, Lord, and, and we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. We thank you for this wind, Lord, the breeze that is here, but Lord, we pray that it will not interfere with the message, Lord, that you have to go out today. May you be glorified, for it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we share about every Sunday, uh, we started this ministry in June of 2015. In January 2016, we began a series of messages on the red letter words in the Bible. That means the words that Jesus spoke. And we started with his, when his first words that he spoke at the age of 12. We are now, today is 114th message. And we're looking at John 13. John 13. If you would go with us uh, there, and we're going to start in verse 31. Now, in John 13, you must realize that we are in the last 15 hours of the life of our Lord. And uh, in verses 31 to 35, Jesus discusses two main topics. First, his departure, and then his new commandment to his disciples and to us today. So we're going to look at those very briefly. The first thing, again, we want to look at his departure because that's what comes up first. At this particular time, as you will see when we read verse 31, Judas has left the room and went out into the dark. And Jesus begins to speak to his disciples about another departure that's going to take place, his. So in verse 31, John 13, verse 31, it says, so when he, that means Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. So five times, if you notice there, Jesus uses the form of the word glorifies. For in a reason he did that, because to him, death is not a, a mournful tragedy, but a magnificent triumph. That's what he came to do, to live, to die, that we might have life. It's a glorious, not a gruesome experience. Psalms 116.5 reminds us, even in our death, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So Jesus knows that his teachings are difficult for his disciples to understand. So patiently, <coughs> excuse me, and tenderly, he assures them now of his care for them. In verse 33, John 13, 33, notice it says, little children. And by the way, the reason I emphasize that, this is the only time in scriptures that Jesus called his disciples little children. But again, he's trying to patiently and tenderly come and tell them how much he cares for them. So he says, little children, I shall not be with you. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say it to you. So Jesus now is no longer, as we have in the past, many messages talking in mystical shades and meanings, that we call them parables, but he is now being very explicit to them. How he now presents to his disciples with, he presents them with three hard facts that they must face because they are with him at this time. First of all, that his departure is imminent. It is necessary. He is going to depart. Secondly, people will look for him and the people is going to be confused because of his death. And then nobody can go with him. Not even them at this time. They can't go with him. And later we're going to go into that in another message, hopefully the following message, where he talks to Peter about that coming and following him in what is going to take place. So this possesses, possesses a very big problem for the disciples. 
how would they go on? How would they continue the ministry without him? Uh, what will be their identity now that they have don't have the master? They don't have Jesus with them. Of course, he has been sending them out, and he's been teaching them that, that they can minister without him in the physical body, but in their mind, they don't see it. And then they want to say, well, they're going, they think they're going to lose their impact that they're having or have had on the world. Now, the second thing he talks about is a new commandment. Jesus uh, is understanding that they have insecurity and he wants to stabilize them and he gives them and us today, actually this is for us, a heavy commandment. In jo verse 34, John 13, 34, 35, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another so let me ask you a simple straightforward question this morning if you're a born again washed in the blood of jesus christ follower of christ how are people supposed to identify you when you're in a crowd of other people are people to know you are a Christian, that you are a Christ-like child of God because? Now, think about that. But let me ask it in a different way so that instead of you're looking at yourself, we're looking at and others. Is everyone, let me ask you, is everyone who wears a cross around their neck or uh, earrings or shaped like uh, a cross or even lapel pins are are these uh, does that mean they're a christian does that identify them as a christian no not really because i once asked a waiter we were in a restaurant there in panama city and a waiter had this beautiful cross hanging around his neck and uh i said so you're a christian and he says to me what's that and i asked him why do you wear the cross? And he replied, it was a gift. I then told him the story of Jesus dying on the cross and why most people wear the cross, that he died for our sins. And he said, I'd never heard that before. So wearing a cross does not mean that you are a Christian. It's not a symbol of Christianity to a lot of people. Then how about if a person has a God is my co-pilot bumper sticker on the car. Does that make, does everybody that is a believer and follow Christ need to have a God is my co-pilot bumper sticker? No, because if they really are a follower of Christ and they're a disciple of Christ, they would actually have one owner that says God is my pilot, my Lord, my master. Because if he's your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat, you're in trouble. But, uh, and then one of my favorites, I try to put one on about every vehicle, uh, for a long time, I did anyway. Uh, the Ichidus fish symbol, which they used back in the days right after Christ uh, suffered and died on the cross. Um, most church people, even church going people, don't even know what it stands for, but it's a symbol that you are a Christ, uh, a follower of Christ. It means Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. So does everyone that has an Ichidus fish on their car or wears one on the shirt, does that make them a Christian? No. Uh, how about t-shirts and what we call Christian wear today? Uh, caps, lapel pins. Uh, because a person wears that, does that make people want to respect them and know that they are a follower of Christ, that they are a Christian? I don't think so. Well, one time I was at the fair there in Bonifay and come across a young man. He had this wonderful t-shirt on. It had a picture of Christ on the cross. and. Um, and then he had on a Budweiser hat. So uh, with that picture on his t-shirt, and I asked him if he knew Christ as his Lord and Savior. Uh, and he just told me that the shirt was a cheap shirt he got at the thrift store. So he was wearing it. So wearing t-shirts and hats and lapel pins don't necessarily make you or identify you as a Christian. So how are people to know that we are a disciple of Christ? John 13, 34 through 35 says again, a new commandment I give to you.
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So he gives us a symbol, a way that we can know that we, or others can know that we are his disciples. Now, did you notice the dynamics of this new commandment? Now, this is not simply a revised or additional command, but a new, it's fresh, it's unique. You say, no, Tim, it's in the Bible even before Jesus said that. Um, love in itself is not a new commandment. We go back to Leviticus 19.18 which says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God said that. God the Father. And Jesus said, I give you a new commandment to love one another. You see, the new thing here appears to be the mutual affection that Christians are to have for each other on account of Christ's great love for them. Jesus set the example for us and now he calls them and us to follow his steps. Remember, we just last week looked at where he made himself of a servant. He loved the disciples. He sat down and he washed their feet. He gave us an example of what loving one another is all about. The word Jesus uses in verse 35 is the form of the word love, agape, which is, uh, there, there are four words in the Greek that is used for love. And agape is the greatest. It, it means to seek the highest good of another. This type of love, see, he's talking about here refuses to respond negatively to other people, uh, to other believers. It refuses to reject other believers. It refuses to demand conditions on other believers. It refuses to nitpick the lint of someone's soul. So he's, when Jesus says, as I have loved you. But let me go back to that now. Again, I must emphasize what he is talking about here. He is talking about Christians loving Christians are disciples of Christ following loving disciples of Christ. Yes, we are to love our enemies, but that's a different love. We're supposed to love those that are not followers of Christ. But he uses a different word. He uses the phyllis, the uh, for it, uh, friendship. You're supposed to be friendly to them, but you're not. You don't have to participate and in what they're doing if they're not of Christ. We don't participate we care for others that are not Christians we pray for them we try to let them see Christ enough that they want to be a part of what we are a part of we're to be the salt that makes them thirsty for him and the light that draws them out of the darkness but this particular verse is talking to followers of Christ Christians loving Christians they will know we are followers of Christ because we love one another when Jesus said that again as I have loved you he set himself as the standard by which they are for we are to forever actually uh, measure our love for one another he's telling us here he's telling them I left the splendors I left the comforts of heaven because I loved you I left all of this I called you to be mine knowing all your faults he is saying, I taught you even when you were stubborn and closed-minded. I loved you. I corrected you when you stepped out of line. I even washed your feet on my way to my death. All of this was for your highest good. My interest in what he said is saying is not in myself, but in you. Now, I had a friend uh, just last week tell me an interesting story that sort of exemplifies this in the culture and the day and age in which we live. He said that his daughter lives there in North Carolina and she just started attending a small church there in North Carolina. And uh, just out of the blue here a while back, she had a seizure. So she's no longer allowed to drive while, she, while they try to figure out what caused this particular seizure. 
So the people at the church have come around them and are loving them. The pastor's wife has been picking her up and carrying her to work and to the doctor's office every day of whatever she needs to go and then going back and picking her up and bringing her home. And it's not uh, a short drive. It's a pretty good drive from her home to where she works and plus the lady leaving her own home and carrying her. And the church ladies have been <coughs> fixing meals for them. And uh, so this particular friend of mine here in Florida who has this daughter there in North Carolina, he's ready to move to North Carolina because he wants to be a part of a church that loves its people like that. See, that is what he's talking about. We must love each other, care for each other to the highest degree that we will do for others and help others. And Jesus gives us a mandate for this in John 13. It's a, it's a mandate that adds a new dimension uh, uh, to the meaning of love. And this dimension not only changes lives, but it's in a compelling way it shows the world that we belong to Jesus so that they will say, hey, that's great, that's love. That's what Christ is all about. I do see, I do understand. So notice again, yes, he told us to love our neighbors, but that's not agape love here. It's friendship and we're to friend others and help others to come to Christ. But here again, he is talking about agape love for other believers. We are to stand up for one another and be counted. So what kind of impact would that have again on the world? Incredible, right? It'll have an incredible impact. Nobody can ignore authentic love. Nothing is more impressive than unselfish attention. Notice what it says in verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That word know does not refer to knowledge that has been taught, but to knowledge that has been felt. They will know because they see, because they feel, because they understand this love that you are my disciples. What will, again, the deserver, uh, uh, observer know about us? What would they know about you and me as followers of Christ? They will know that we belong to Jesus. That our love for each other is a distinctive badge of his ownership in us. You see, again, these other things that I talked about earlier, the attentious fish Oh, it tells people I have a belief that I put on my car. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior, my Master, my Lord. If you wear a cross around your neck, uh, it may tell others that you're connected to a religion. But love, love for others, especially other believers, to an extent that you do the most, the utmost for their help I mean for their highest and you regard them you do things for them that links us to Jesus himself that's the mark that matters the mark that makes a difference I want to close and we get this thought many people today are afraid to love because they've been hurt and they know hurt uh, uh, they know love opens us up but I want to say to you, if you never step out on a limb with people and God, you'll never grasp the fruit of, nur of a nourishing relationship with you. If you never step out on the limb and love someone, you'll never understand and receive the fruit of that nourishing relationship. C.S. Lewis wrote in The Four Loves, in his book, The Four Loves, on page 169, he wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. 
lock it safe in a casket or a coffin of your selfishness but in that casket safe dark motionless airless it will change it will not be broken it will become unbreakable impenetrable and irredeemable we don't want that trust God love him accept his love and learn to uh, love others but as we close again do others by knowing you know that you love your brethren authentic love began <coughs> with accepting the greatest expression of love that has ever been offered to you which is the love that God offered freely to everyone and once you begin to experience his love and begin to building your relationship with him authentic love then becomes a reality that you can share with others as you become a part of the family of God and hopefully a, a local church that you can grow in where not everybody's perfect and not everybody's a believer but you can find them and you can love them and you can grow in your relationship and others will see Christ in you and glorify him and know from your expression of love that you are his disciple first John 4 7 says beloved let us love one another again for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God he who does not love does not know God for God is love if you don't have a personal relationship with Christ that has made a difference in your heart and you have experienced his love and love for others you've experienced true agape love if you've never come to there I would like for you to stay with us afterwards or, or contact us or contact someone you know is a believer and a follower and let us know how God is dealing with you and because we want you to know there's places on the internet where you can contact us at our phone number 850-547-5228 or our, uh, our our email Tim Hall underscore 2000 at yahoo.com and we would love to share with you we would love to pray with you and help you find a local body that you can come part of and grow in your walk with Christ but as we close again I want to share with you how you can know this love and know this peace that you can only receive from knowing the agape love that Christ loves you with. Romans 5 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 6 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. How do we receive that love? Romans 10 9 says that if we confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your gospel through these means and with these that you have opened it up for that they can hear it today. And thank you for the wind, Lord, and I pray that they will be able to hear the message that you have for them through the sound of the wind. Lord, blowing this cool breeze on us today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your love, that wonderful love. And we pray that you will help us, Lord, to show more of this love to others, that they will know that we are yours and your disciples. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And again, we want to encourage you to live today as though Christ died yesterday, he arose this morning, and he's coming back. Because he is. He's coming back tomorrow. Amen.